Hi there, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Patrick Wensing, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame. Today, I'll be giving a brief review over spatial vector algorithms, and then discussing their application in the identification and control of legged systems. I think it's an exciting time to be a dynamicist and to be working on legged robots, in part due to the many phenomenal platforms that are beginning to make their way out of our labs and into the real world. Whether it's Boston Dynamics Atlas or Digit from Agility Robotics, these systems are able to move dynamically through the world and do meaningful work within it. We see similar progress on the quadruped side as well, with Ghost Robotics Vision 60 beginning to support our troops and the phenomenal dynamic performance of the MIT Mini Cheetah robot and the many platforms that it has subsequently inspired. We're beginning to send our, these systems into uncertain environments where they're gonna make and break contact with the world at unexpected times. These contact transitions are highly dynamic with large changes in velocity, and they're really important for these systems to get right since a bad foothold can lead to a rapid loss of balance. So today we're gonna to talk about strategies for these systems to make good decisions surrounding these contact events by using rigid body dynamics algorithms to help them make those decisions more quickly. I think this problem of managing contact transitions is more fundamental within our field. For instance, with robots that we might send into our home to assist us, these systems likewise are going to collide with the objects that they're needing to manipulate or with us in unexpected ways. And so this problem of managing dynamic physical interaction is much more fundamental, even though we'll look at it in the context of legged robots today. So in terms of where we'll go, I'll first start out with a brief review of spatial vector fundamentals, where we'll look at the velocity of a rigid body by considering a vector field giving the velocities of its body fixed points. After we understand the dynamics of a single body, we'll then look at how we can identify dynamic models of systems of bodies, particularly highlighting recent geometric underpinnings of this problem. I'll then turn my attention to control and tell you about a new method that we can use to rapidly compute the Coriolis matrix and look at its, at its application in contact detection for MIT Cheetah 3. Okay. So as I said, we're gonna look at spatial vectors as vector fields. And let me do that through uh, a simple example. Let's consider a skateboard that's traveling forward at a constant forward velocity. And we're gonna consider the vector field of velocities for its body fixed points. So here they are, X is forward, Y is to the side of the skateboard, Z is normal to its face. And so here, you know, at any point on the skateboard, it's moving to the right with a constant velocity. And over here, this arrow indicates that if this point were fixed to the skateboard, it would be moving to the right with that same velocity too. So we're gonna denote by uh, upright V skate, this vector field overall. V skate represents the total vector field, not any individual vector within it. Now let's consider a little bit more complicated situation where there's a top that's spinning on this skateboard rotating relative to it with a constant angular velocity. And let's think about the vector field that gives the velocity of body fixed points on this top relative to the skateboard. In that case, they're spinning purely circularly about the axis of the top. Now, what I'd like to do is to, to note that for any vector over here, this represents the velocity of this point on the top uh, relative to the skateboard. And correspondingly over here, this represents the velocity of that point on the skateboard. And so I can add up those two, uh, those two arrows, and that corresponds to composing relative velocities. And I can do that everywhere in space. And when I do that, I get the velocity of the skateboard plus the velocity of the top relative to the skateboard. The result is a vector field that gives you the velocity of all the body fixed points on the top. So let me make a couple of observations. One, as I've argued, we can add up any two vector fields of this type, and that corresponds to adding up relative motions. Also, if I have any of these vector fields, I can multiply the vector field by an arbitrary scalar just by scaling each of the individual vectors in that, in that field. So I have this set of objects. I can add them together, and I can multiply them by an arbitrary scalar. The implication then is that this set of objects, namely the set of rigid body velocities, forms a vector space that we'll denote as script M. Let's get a little bit more insight into it. Let's look now just at two of the velocity vectors in this, uh, on this diagram. I'll label these as points A and B, and the velocities of these body fixed points with uh, script letters. Now, if I were to give you the 
moment arm between these two points and the angular velocity of the body, then you could relate these two velocities, VA and VB, through a conventional formula. Now, let's imagine that point A is fixed in space inertially. In that case, then if I fix that point, this vector field is uniquely determined by the x, y, and z components of VA and the x, y, and z components of the angular velocity. After I give you that information, I can calculate the velocity at any other point using simple kinematics. So these six numbers, these six coordinates, are what we would call the Pluker coordinates for the spatial velocity at the top. Here, I'm denoting upright v top as the vector field itself and using an underbar to represent its expression in some basis. So in conclusion, this uh, vector field of rigid body velocities actually is a 6D vector space because we can describe it with these, these six numbers uniquely. Now that we've gotten some insight into spatial velocities, let's take a look at spatial accelerations. So if I put this vector field in motion, I can see how it evolves over time. And at any time, I can describe that vector field uniquely by this arrow here, the A, and the angular velocity of the body. Now, I can take this, this vector field in every point in space, I can look at its time derivative, and through that, I generate a new vector field that we call the spatial acceleration of the top. In this case, it's kind of a boring vector field. It's constant point-wise across space, and actually stays constant across time. Let's take a look at this. So over here, if I look at this vector, its horizontal component is fixed, its vertical component is growing in the negative y direction, that, and that checks out. We look at any other vector, let's look at this one, constant horizontal component, vertical component is growing in the negative y direction at a constant rate, that checks out. Right? And as it turns out, no matter how you're moving, general 3D motion with rotation and translation, this same thing works. And you can always characterize that vector field on the right by the rate of change in VA and the rate of change in the angular velocity of the body. I'd now like to use this concept of spatial accelerations to help us get some insight into uh, how we might define cross products for these spatial velocity vectors. So just reviewing traditional Cartesian cross products first, if I have a body with this vector r fixed in the body and the body is rotating with angular velocity omega, then it's the rate of change in r is just given by omega cross r. That's to say that this Cartesian cross product gives the rate of change in one vector due to some external rotation. Let's see how this generalizes now when working with spatial vectors. So let's think about each of these vectors' rate of change, or these vector fields' rate of change. This, this vector field here for the skate, it looks the same now as it will three seconds from now. It doesn't change. It's constant. This vector field over here, it has a constant shape. The shape doesn't change, but it moves over time due to the motion of the skateboard. It's as if the skateboard was holding a constant set of vectors that are then moving in space. And so we can generalize uh, the cross product to, these, to the spatial case by defining it as the operation that gives the rate of change in one vector field due to the external motion of another. So in this case, as an example, the time rate of change in the green vector field is given by the velocity of the skateboard, the thing that's moving the vector field, crossed with the vector field itself. And so I hope this might give you a little bit of intuition into the action of little a d v that's used within uh, a, a Lie algebra context. Of course, at the end of the day, this, these two operations are exactly the same. This is just a, a different way, I think a little bit more physical way uh, of looking at what it means. Okay, now that we understand velocities and accelerations, let's take a look at forces. They're a little bit more tricky. Let's imagine I've got our skateboard again and two Cartesian forces script F1 and script F2 acting on it. I'm gonna say that a spa spatial force really describes the net dynamic effect of some force field. And of course, if I pick some point A in space, then I can describe that net effect by a net force and a net moment about this point. So we can describe a, a spatial force vector with these two quantities. However, you know, the, the overall effect really doesn't depend on point A, that point is kind of immaterial. So I'll denote by upright F, as the kind of abstract spatial vector that represents the, this uh, net dynamic effect overall. More formally, this, this object 
lives in a, in a space that can be identified with the, the, the dual vector space to the spatial motion vectors. So here this star represents the dual of a vector space. Now, uh, building on this example, let's imagine I've, I've got these forces. I can look at the net force and the net moment about some point, and then I can put this, this, th this in motion here. And of course, that as the skateboard moves and carries along that force field, the net dynamic effect is changing. So we'll define a spatial cross force cross product similar to before that gives the rate of change in a spatial more force or momentum from external motion. So here, the time rate of change in spatial vector f is given by the velocity of the skate, the thing that's carrying along that force field crossed with the spatial force itself. And here, this star uh, represents that it's a spatial cross product and that it has to just, it has to do with forces. It's different from the one before. And this is in contrast to the notation that many of you might be more familiar with, where little ad v star really represents the, the adjoint of the linear transformation ADV. Right? And so here, the star has a mathematical meaning. Uh, in our case, the star just means, hey, this has to do with forces. And so there's actually a discrepancy here. They're, they're off from one another by a sign. So just something to be aware of. OK, we understood velocities and forces. Let's look at how they're related. So of course, inertia is the thing that maps uh, between these two spaces. So let's imagine if I have some spatial velocity v, and I've got some distribution of density or distribution of mass in space that's captured by this operator i, this inertia operator. I can use that to map these velocities to the, the total momentum of the, uh, of the body, where this momentum kind of generalizes the notion of a spatial force, but just for momentum. And it turns out that this, this uh, operation is a linear one. And, and if you think, you know, I have some distribution of mass in space. A moment later, if this body is moving, that distribution of mass is going to be different relative to the world. And so we can look at the time rate of change in this operator, and it's given by the following formula. You might try to justify this for yourself. The point of me bringing this up is not to try to give you intuition into it, but rather to look at how we can use it. So if I look at the generalization of F equals MA, force is equal to the rate of change in momentum, and applying product rule, I get inertia times acceleration plus I dot times V. And I think you can see that if we plug in this equation, you have a V cross V cancellation such that the final result is as follows. So we've got our equation of motion for a rigid body. It holds in a coordinate free sense. OK, now that we understand one rigid body, let's look at how we can identify dynamic models for systems of bodies. First, by looking at how we can get the dynamics of a system of bodies. The key player here is going to be our body Jacobians. These are mappings that relate our joint rates to the velocity of each body. I can take a time derivative. I can get something at the acceleration level too. So let's now look at how we can go from body equations to system equations. This is somewhat standard, so my discussion of it is going to be a little bit heuristic. So let's imagine I have the net force for body I. That net force includes some applied forces as well as gravity that might be acting on the body. So let's take gravity out of the equation, let's subtract it off, and now I've just got the applied forces both from actuators and from constraints. If I then multiply by the Jacobian transpose, that tells me the amount of torques that I'm going to need at my joints in order to, uh, to create this motion. And this is, these are the torques required to move body I. I can then sum up over all I, and I get the torques required to move the entire system. If I then plug in these equations from above, then we end up with our canonical equations, where we have our mass matrix times joint accelerations plus Coriolis matrix times joint rates plus our gravity term. The thing I'd like to emphasize here is that if we look one line up, these inertias appear linearly in this equation. That's something that we'll use a little bit later. Let's get a little bit more insight into these inertias. So let's say I fix a coordinate frame to my body, and I know the distribution of density in space. Then I can compute the mass, the mass times the center of mass, and the traditional Cartesian inertia tensor about this origin uh, using some standard integrals. And once I have these things, I can take and express that inertia operator in a, a coordinate frame that corresponds to this, this coordinate. And it takes the form where I've got Cartesian inertia in the upper left, 
uh, mass times center of mass cross product terms on the off diagonal and mass times identity matrix. And the important thing here is that if I you know, take these three, three items, I parameterize them, and I put all of those in a, a vector pi i that has dimension 10, one for mass, three for mass times center of mass, and six for the upper triangle of this symmetric inertia matrix. If I do that, then these 10 numbers parameterize i i, and they actually parameterize it linearly. As a result, since our equations of motion we saw were linear in those inertias, and the inertias are linear in these parameters, I can always write down these equations of motion in the following form, where y is a regressor matrix, and pi collects all of the inertial parameters for all the bodies in my systems. Once I have this, the significance is that I can get some samples of q, q dot, q double dot, and tau, and then I can attempt to find my inertial parameters through least squares. And this is pretty classical. The challenge, however, is that sometimes you set this formulation up, you solve it, and it comes back and it tells you, hey, I found the mass of the second body, it's negative five kilograms. There's nothing in this formulation that constrains it to give you a physically reasonable result. So what's it gonna take for us to get that? Well, let's consider one, one density distribution. I can use those integrals, get some parameters, and I could consider then taking all possible density distributions and seeing how those map over to parameters. Let's call that set P. How, what is it gonna take for our parameters to be physically realizable? Well, uh, the mass is gonna have to be positive. The rotational inertia matrix about the center of mass needs to be positive definite. And a little bit more esoterically, if you look at the eigenvalues of that matrix, any one of them has to be less than or equal to the sum of the other two. And these are called the triangle inequalities of inertia. We've recently shown that all of these conditions can be captured together in, uh, in the following condition. Our inertial parameters are physically realizable if and only if the following matrix is positive definite. It turns out all of our inertial parameters appear linearly here. So this is a linear matrix inequality that we can enforce quite effectively within convex optimization. The other exciting thing is that this shows that the inertial parameters are isomorphic to the four by four positive definite matrices. And positive definite matrices can be endowed with a, a Riemannian metric and then inherit a, a curved Riemannian structure. Lee and Park have developed this in a, a subsequent paper in, in 2018, where they showed that, in fact, you can compute the geodesic distance between any two of these, these matrices. We call these pseudo-inertia pseudo matrices. You can compute the distance between them in closed form. But it turns out these geodesic distances are, uh, are not convex in the inertial parameters. So it makes it somewhat difficult to use. And we'll come back to this later. So we did some experiments to identify the cheetah leg, moved it around and used this to identify viscous friction, Coulomb friction, and the parameters of rotors and links. And we set up the following optimization problem that uh, can be solved in under two seconds for thousands of data points. Here, I'm minimizing the L2 loss on the, the, uh, on the data set and then considering some regularization that penalizes the de deviation from CAD parameters and enforcing that all the parameters must be physically realistic, that they must represent some ridge of body. So let's see how they compare to our CAD model. So here I'm drawing CAD model, and then these uh, inertia ellipsoids represent the equidensity ellipsoids of the identified parameters. So here, this, this one represents the identified mass distribution, if you will, for the, uh, for the shank. It doesn't look too awful. Here, this is the identified mass distribution for the thigh. That one's pretty bad. So actually, in, some, in that 2018 paper, uh, Taeyun and Frank recognized that the issue is this uh, Euclidean regularizer that ends up being dependent on your choice of coordinates. And so it's difficult to disentangle effects of coordinate choice from the effects of the parameters themselves. So we put our heads together and recently published a paper that inherits the best of kind of both of our approaches we get a coordinate invariant regularizer, and we can solve the problem using convex optimization. The key is that we then identify a new way of regularizing using something called the entropic divergence. Here's its formula, it has some nice properties. Uh, it's invariant to, to choice of reference frames and physical units, it's dimensionless, and uh, it better encodes the natural distance between mass distributions. I'm calling it KL because it actually has a nice connection with the KL divergence uh, between Gaussians. So 
in terms of encoding distance between uh, distributions, uh, what do I mean by that? Let me show you with an example. Let's imagine I have this gray ellipsoid that stays, stays fixed, and this red one that we're going to move from angle theta equals 0 to 90. And over here, I'm graphing versus theta the, uh, the distance measured between these two distributions according to these uh, different regularizers. And so in black is our Ramanian distance, our gold standard. And sensibly, it says that these two distributions are closest when, uh, when theta equals 0 and most when theta equals 90. And we see that our entropic divergence measure, it has that same exact shape and actually can be shown to coincide with the Ramanian distance up to second order. By comparison, the Euclidean distance, here we've used SI units, kilograms, meters, seconds, and the rotational inertias are, are quite small, you know, on the order of 10 to the negative fourth or so. And so this hardly shows any variation as you change, uh, as you turn, change theta. So there's a simple fix that we proposed in our paper. Uh, take out this Euclidean regularizer, drop in this, this new, new one, and you have a convex optimization problem that you can solve to global optimality. Here are the resulting distributions. They not, not only represent some, uh, some rigid body, but actually are a much better representation of the rigid bodies that we're working with. In terms of performance, uh, we can track the, uh, the required torques quite well. So here in blue, I'm showing you the measured torque from the amplifier at the, the hip and the knee. I should say more that the estimated torque from the amplifier. And in red, the estimated torque from our model. Right? And so we can essentially do uh, inverse dynamics down to about a newton meter. All right, so now that we have these models, let's talk about how we can use them for control. The most common use, uh, I would say, probably is the inverse dynamics model, which we can evaluate, of course, with the recursive Newton-Euler algorithm. It has computational complexity that scales linearly with the number of bodies. We might do this for computed torque control. Sometimes we don't need the whole model, though. For instance, you might just want the mass matrix. And you can compute that with the composite rigid body algorithm. That has computational complexity O and D, where N is the number of bodies, and D is the depth of your connectivity tree. You might need this if you're doing operational space control, or it's close friend, whole body QP-based control, or when doing simulation when N is small. There are other components that we need for, for uh, different algorithms. We need the Coriolis matrix when doing adaptive control or passivity-based control or contact and fault detection. And uh, actually, in these cases, there's not just one answer for what, what a good C matrix is. You can define many of them that satisfy the equations of motion. And it turns out that for all these applications, we need a stronger property that h dot minus 2c is skew symmetric. So we've introduced a new algorithm that gets that, and it has the same computational complexity as CRBA. Let me tell you about this algorithm, but first tell you a little bit about, about CRBA so that you understand its operation. So, uh, let's consider a system that's at rest and without any gravity. And in that case, the torque, the torques required are just the mass matrix times the joint accelerations. So if we look at uh, entry ij, what that really gives us is the ith torque in the case when the jth joint is accelerating with a unit magnitude and all other joints remain stationary. So let's look at an example here. I've got i and j labeled, and let's consider the motion created by joint j, described by the spatial vector, phi j, and we have similarly phi i, describing the free modes of motion for the ith joint. When joint j accelerates and all other joints remain fixed, then all of these bodies in blue accelerate together, as if they're rigidly attached. So this motivates us to define what we call a composite rigid body inertia. It really represents the total inertia of all those bodies in blue. Once we have that, we can then get the ijth entry of the mass matrix quite readily. Here in this formula, phi j tells you the acceleration of all the bodies in blue. You multiply that with this composite inertia, inertia times uh, acceleration. That tells you the force needed to move all the bodies in blue. And then you can project that force onto the ith, ith joint in order to get the torque that's required by the actuator that lives there. We can then do this for a bunch of combinations of i and j and turn it into an algorithm. Uh, so here's the composite rigid body algorithm. It first initializes all those composite rigid body inertias and then has a main inward pass that computes and sums up all of those composite rigid body inertias. 
constitutes most of the heavy lifting. Then once we have that, we can compute this force required for all the blue bodies. We can pass it down the, uh, down the chain, project it onto each of the joint axes, and get each of the entries of the mass matrix. Our new algorithm inherits a lot of this similar structure. So we begin to uh, uh, our path to get the Coriolis matrix by first factorizing the equations of motion for a rigid body. We take them and let's take this term in gray and we'll define that by matrix B. And I'll plug that in here. Now we have something for a, a velocity relationship that looks similar to this acceleration relationship, allowing us to uh, kind of exploit some of the same structures as in CRBA. It turns out that this choice of B is only one, one valid choice, very similar to how there are many valid Coriolis matrices. There's many valid, different valid ways that you could factorize these body level terms. Once, we, once we've made a choice, we can consider, consider composite terms that collect these Coriolis effects, defining a composite Coriolis effect matrix BJC. This is most of the heavy lifting. Once we have it, we can get the entries of the Coriolis matrix as follows. Here we've got something that looks very similar to our formula from CRBA. This effectively counts for Coriolis effects from the velocity of the jth body. And then we have another term here that ends up corresponding to Coriolis effects from the velocity of the jth joint. The Coriolis matrix isn't, uh, isn't symmetric, so we need a corresponding formula for the other side of the diagonal, and you can check it out in the paper. The really beautiful thing from this, however, is that if our choice of B matrix satisfies that I dot equals B plus B transpose, then it follows that the resulting Coriolis matrix C satisfies that H dot minus 2C is skew symmetric. So a skew symmetric like property at a body level then leads to the skew symmetry property at the system level, which I think is quite beautiful. How do we turn it into an algorithm? Well, it's similar to before. We have an outward pass that initializes the uh, composite rigid body inertia and these composite Coriolis effects. We then have a main inward pass that does most of the heavy lifting that computes these, these terms and sums them up. And then finally, we have an inward pass that takes some forces that we compute, passes them down the chain, projects those onto different joint axes, and we get the, the entries of the Coriolis matrix. Overall, this has the same computational complexity, and we can actually compute this algorithm in about 10 microseconds in CC++ for quadrupeds with 20 joints, so more than we need. I'll alert you, actually, in our paper, we have an algorithm not just to compute the Coriolis matrix, but also the Christoffel symbols. So the, the geometrically inclined uh, of you might be interested in it and uh, encourage you to check, check it out. OK. So I'd like to finish by talking about how we can apply this for contact detection with G to 3. As I motivated at the beginning, contact detection is something fundamental for our systems operating in uncertain environments whether they're collaborating with unexpected or colliding with unexpected obstacles or unexpected people. And we can account for these, coll these collisions by taking our equations of motion and adding an extra term here that accounts for the uh, disturbance effects from the environment. There's some really nice classical algorithms to estimate these disturbances where we have essentially kind of a feed forward like term and then a term that is low pass filtered. So here, lambda is a cutoff frequency C that's user chosen and S is the Laplace variable. So we apply a low pass filter to all this stuff. And one of the things that we need is this term that we can compute by first getting the Coriolis matrix and then computing this product. We hit some wrinkles, though, in applying this. Now, the, the standard pipeline is to essentially low pass filter both sides of these, uh, this equation of motion, do some integration by parts on the convolution integral there. That allows you to remove Q double dot from, uh, from your sensing requirements. And, and you get that equation that I showed on the previous slide. The challenge, however, is that this filter is in continuous time. And so we inevitably need to discretize it for any implementation on a computer. You get something like this. So we were having some issues and we thought, well, you know, what if we just take that discrete time filter and we apply it to a discretized version of the equations of motion? What's going to happen? Well, as it turns out, we get something that looks very structurally similar but there's a different term that is multiplying the generalized momentum. You can see uh, the, the details in the paper for how to calculate this constant beta. Let me show you the effect of, uh, of these differences. So here I'm showing time on the x, normal force on the z. Uh, purple is the force 
the vertical force from mini cheetah, and blue is estimated normal force from this method, and uh, orange is estimated normal force from this method. This first period is in stance, so we have large forces, and this other period is in swing, so these uh, strategies should, should both be giving us zero. They're not due to discretization effects, but we see that those effects are worse for this blue method. So using the orange one allows us to be more sensitive to, to when we're making contact. Let me show you the application of this uh, once we combine it with MPC for locomotion. So here, Cheetah doesn't know that it's walking upstairs. There's no cameras. Uh, it's simply feeling that it's collided with the stairs through this disturbance observer and then modifying its control, turning off its swing leg control and switching to, to stance leg control via MPC. So this work was collaborative and the experiments, they were with a really phenomenal team of folks uh, at MIT. So to, to wrap things up, I've reviewed spatial vector algebra and uh, given this kind of new perspective thinking about vector fields. The operations that we get at the end are equivalent to the dynamic equations that we get from Lie group and Lie algebra formalisms. And I hope that uh, my alternate perspective has given you a different, uh, a different take on concepts that you already know. Likewise, with the spatial vector algebra, we can get coordinate de free development of algorithms. I then talked about recent strategies that allow us to identify inertial parameters by convex optimization over the manifold of physically feasible, feasible inertial parameters and talked about new algorithms that allow us to rapidly calculate the dynamics of our system and help us to detect contact for event-based locomotion in unstructured terrains. I'm very excited to continue working on these rigid body dynamics algorithms. We're looking at them right now to accelerate motion optimization pipelines, and that's something that I'll be uh, looking forward to talk to you about in the future. So with that, I'll thank all of my collaborators and, and funding agencies, and, and thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.